kinds of things. Most of them are submitted by AAW members around the country. Um, there's always something of interest, and they really cover a lot of ground. So hopefully you'll join. And if you are, you can go into their archives and find information on virtually anything you want. So uh, think about joining if you're not. Um, for J January, um, this just changed. We, I, had, I have them written backwards here, but another friend of mine, Dave Buckholz, who is, uh, lives in New York, but he's a member of our club in Vermont, and every month, unfailingly, he has to, he has to drive to the ferry landing, take the boat across to, to Vermont, go to the meeting, and get back to the landing in time to go home, and he has been so faithful and every, he does quite a few demos for us. And uh, every month he brings in some new kind of uh, bowl uh, and he's uh, uh, figured out tremendous ways to embellish pieces. And if you look at the August uh, issue of the AAW Journal, he's got a piece in there about how to put raindrops on, on your bowl. And it's a technique uh, that uh, he created this as far as I know. Uh, and they're really, they're, it makes it three-dimensional, yet it isn't. It's done with paint. Uh, so he's going to show us how to do that. Both of these people will be doing workshops, too. Uh, I'm not sure if it'll be the day after their demo here or a day or two later, uh, but we'll be announcing that. And then we have um, Nick Cook, someone that, um, that's a name that probably means something to most of you. Uh, he's from up in Atlanta, and he's going to come down and do our February demo. So we have, we have quite a bit to look forward to. <clears throat> we have secured the uh, Woodland Hall again at the Sun and Fun for our party. Uh, it's January 5th. It's a little earlier in the month than we wanted, but the, their um, slots were filling up very quickly. So we grabbed it uh, before somebody else got it. So Saturday, January 5th, and um, if you're interested, um, uh, give your name to uh, uh, Alan Levine and um, you just tell him uh, what your food choice is and how many people you want to bring and bring your spouse, your a friend, your family. We had, a, we had a couple of visitors last year. One gal, she, I think she was from the Washington DC area and she got so excited about bidding and I think she went home with about six different items from our for our raffle, so she added a, she added a lot to our festivities that night. We will uh, we will have a raffle as usual. Um, the other thing that in past years we've had a um, sort of an instant gallery, the way they do at the symposiums. Uh, it, there weren't too many that got brought in last year, so I would encourage you to bring a couple of pieces in uh, that you've been working on, just to show uh, the members if you haven't brought them to show and tell, or even if you have. Um, uh, bring them on in, and we, it'll just be there. We won't go, it won't be like show and tell where we talk about each one. But if you have a piece you'd like to share, I uh, encourage you to bring it in. Um, I didn't put this in my notes, but I'm, I see a um, wig stand down there. Uh, as always, we have our three projects, uh, our wig stands for the Cancer Society, uh, our cremation urns for the, uh, the VA, and then uh, the, the uh, bowls for the food bank, and this is winding down. I'm going to get in touch with them in the next couple days to get the timing on that. So if you have some that uh, uh, you want to finish up for the food bank, um, they should be done uh, within the next week, because I think they're, I think that's in November. And we're going to go down, one of, a, one of the board members will go down and help them. Some of you have given um, bowls that are large, they want to have more than $25. For those of you who don't know, everybody who donates on their big fundraising effort, $25 gets a free bowl. And uh, we've given them, I don't know, 300 bowls maybe. Uh, I've kind of lost count. Uh, last year we raised almost $6,000 for them. Um, and that's a lot of $25 bowls. We'll have a few more bigger ones that they'll put a little higher price on to hopefully they can get. So um, uh, this is a great effort. There's a huge need here. We think of Sarasota as being a fairly well-off county, but something like 75% of the people qualify for um, assistance from the food bank, which is surprising. 
And I did see on the news the other night, they sent truck after truck up to uh, the Panhandle to help people up there. So it's a tremendous cause. Um, so anyway, we'll be wrapping that up and I'll keep you posted on, on um, uh, what, what our finals are on that. Uh, demo volunteers, I've already talked about that. Um, let's see, okay, two more things. Um, uh, a footnote on finishes. We've had many discussions about what is and what isn't a food safe finish. So I'm gonna admit an error, but at the same time, I'm gonna say that I actually was technically correct. Um, I have talked about this uh, Howard's feed and wax. It's beeswax, orange oil, and polymers. Uh, and uh, it is food safe when fully cured. But I was curious, I was on their website and uh, they said uh, under the little blurb about this product, uh, not recommended for food preparation surfaces. Well, does that mean a bowl or not? So I called them and they said, they don't recommend it for bowls, but they said it is perfectly safe. But then in the next breath, they said, what we'd really like to have you buy is butcher block conditioner, and this is made for food, food preparation surfaces. It's uh, mineral oil, food grade mineral oil, uh, beeswax, uh, carnauba wax, and they throw in a little vitamin E too. I think probably more for marketing than any other reason, but so, um, you're fine if you have used this, you're not gonna poison anybody, but um, this is really the one to be using and you're gonna get the same amount of sheen out of it. Um, the reason I like this was because after you use it, the bowl really has a nice citrus smell. Uh, another one that's perfectly safe is pure tongue oil. I think I got this on Amazon, like so many things, um, but you can get it in a lot of places. It's quite thick, so when you apply it, just put a little turpentine or something in it, and that will help help it dry a lot quicker. Once the turpentine evaporates, which it does completely, then you've got a nice, uh, fairly shiny, food safe finish. So that's also a good one. My last uh, note on finishes, <coughs> excuse me. Um, Wipon Poly has been sort of the go-to finish for so many of us for a long, long time. It's a Minwax product. Uh, it works very well. Um, much to my surprise, when I went into Home Depot a few days ago, uh, I went, walked up and down the aisle two or three times. I said, I can't find the Minwax wipe on. I said, we don't sell it anymore. What they do have is Watco, which is a name that you all recognize. They're famous for their uh, Danish oil and all the other uh, finishes. They've been around a long time. They now have a, um, a wipe on poly finish. I used it and I really like it. And both of those bowls that I have down in show and tell uh, are finished with the uh, Watco. So they've, just because they didn't have the other, they've made a convert out of me. So I urge you, if you like Wipe on Poly, give the Watco a try. I think you'll, I think you'll like it. And they have it in both the satin and the um, gloss. Okay, wood finishes. Well, I already talked about um, uh, uh, demo volunteers, I'll just mention it again. We really are looking for people to do little short demos on our Tuesday night meetings. So don't hesitate, speak to Jim, speak to me, speak to any board member, and uh, we'll put you on the roster. And it really can be short. Last uh, note on uh, my demo last month on segmented turning, I, I covered quite a few subjects. I showed a book by Malcolm Tibbetts, the book that I, I wanted you to see that because it had a lot of advanced <clears throat> techniques in it. The best book I found is a guy by the name of James Rogers. He started a turning school out in California. He's been teaching it for 30 years. He came out with this book uh, in the last year or so. I just discovered it. He covers everything, all kinds of uh, techniques. It's um, from the, uh, the old, I won't call it the old style, but the, the style we all think of for segmented where you cut blocks on either a table saw or a chop saw, glue them together into rings. He also gets into this type, uh, the uh, so-called um, vortex bowls, dizzy bowls. They have lots of different names uh, that Frank does so beautifully now. 
Uh, and um, so there's a little bit of everything in this, and I would really urge you, I'm, when I teach the segmented classes, I'm going to kind of use this as a guide. So uh, it's only 16 bucks on Amazon. Very good book. If you're just starting out with segmented work, um, uh, this is the one I recommend. There's probably 20 others out there that you'll be tempted by, but this is a good starter. Um, so, any questions after all? No? Any announcements from anybody else? Yes? Okay, thank you very much. Um, if you're interested in the symposium, uh, don't drag your feet because they might be sold out. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Frank and we'll do a little show and tell. Good job. Um, if you don't mind, <clears throat> I'm gonna ask Dave to do his thing first and then uh, that'll inspire you to go buy something. Thanks, Frank. How's everybody doing? Good to see you all starting to come back. Those of you who have been up north, um, it's been a while. But anyways, uh, specials that we got going on. I know a lot of you have been asking about Red Heart, and we do finally have it back in the racks. It's on the top in the center. It's got a sign on it, so you can't miss it. Retail price is at $17.95, and I've already been informed by Frank that that's an amazing price. For tonight only, I'm giving you all 15% off. Uh, bringing that down to 1525 for just tonight. Um, West Systems Epoxy Quart Kits, that's the Quart 105 resin, the 206 Slow Hardener, and one free bag of color of your choice. Um, I'm doing 10% off that, bringing that down to 8277 for you. If you want to get into that, try filling some cracks and some blanks, get some color in there. Um, let's see, yeah, color of your choice. The fill a box, I see, I'm not even sure if there's anything left in there anymore. Um, I'll check when I'm done here and maybe get a few more boxes for y'all. But self-explanatory, grab a box, fill it up to the top. That's to the threshold. Please do not try to find the tape and make the folds of the box even taller. Um, and a uh, new product that we actually just got is trailer decking. Um, it is Brazilian Apatong. Am I saying that right, Rob? Apatong? Yeah, Angela and Pedra, this stuff, I've looked at it firsthand. It is extremely clear. So those of you that have trailers that need uh, wood decking on it, um, I've got a sample up on my desk. Just touch base with me before you leave. I'll give you pricing, show you the sample. And I've looked over all of it. It's very clear. I didn't see too much wrong with it. You do get those uh, little mineral deposits. I call them the rocks in the wood. I, some guy told me it was called wood of rocks. I think it's wrong, though. But, uh, no, it looks beautiful. It's clean stuff. Um, so, yeah, if you're interested. Yeah, I'll, I'll bring a piece out here. Um, but that's basically all I got going on right now, besides the usual. Um, I'll hand it back off to Frank. Uh, I'm Rob, for those that haven't met me, uh, President Advantage. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention, since there's not a November meeting, we do have some Brazilian cherry 2 and 8 by 2 and 8 squares coming in. We have like a whole tractor trailer load. So they will be very cheap, cheapest Brazilian cherry you'll find in the country. Uh, so we do need to run some specials on those. So. If anybody wants Brazilian sherry, wait until that truckload comes in and we'll have way too much coming. So something we do need to move would be a special price. So if you're thinking of Christmas presents for somebody, think Brazilian sherry. So appreciate it. <laughs> Welcome back, Rob, and thank you for everything you do. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we're, uh, we're in and uh, again, Go f uh, sign up for the symposium. Uh, as you know, I'm the, the featured demonstrator for this year. <clears throat> my, my ability to draw is just incredible. Uh, now, we have a show and tell table today, which is really great. Uh, 
I, I'm especially taken by this, this wig stand that Jim Weeks did. And uh, he obviously took three bowls. It's a three bowl stand. <laughs> and uh, it's just <laughs> so efficient. It's got the little ring container. I really like that. And uh, uh, now it seems that Alan has discovered segmented work. And he's got one here. That's <laughs> a start. He's got another one. This is more the conventional. Here you see he uh, took the rings and moved them a little bit. And uh, here's yet another one. This is a conventional thing. That's great. Uh, and uh, <laughs> Pat, once again, is trying very hard to convince me that cherry is, uh, or uh, apple wood is possible to make something out of. And uh, by golly, he has. <laughs> what kind of apple was it? Macintosh, okay. <laughs> and there's a whole, I want you to admire these because the amount of work that's in here is, of course, all freehand. So the skill is there. And of course, now we have this interest in the vortex bowls. And here you see one by the master. This is Russ, uh, which has uh, pieces of color wood slipped in there. So it, it has just a marvelous accent without overpowering things. Here's another one. And uh, you notice that this has a, uh, a complete circle. So that's really well thought out. A lot of, uh, <coughs> it looks like maple. No, no maple. There's yellow heart and, uh, uh, and obviously walnut and the rim. So this is really great stuff. And now, the interest in pepper mills. Here's, uh, here's one. This is a little taller than most. But you got to appreciate the, uh, the selection of grain as this one comes out. Uh, very nice job. I think that's, that's good. And I hope glad to see there's interest in it. Uh, Norfolk pine, always popular. We just got a fresh shipment in, but um, the uh, the Sun and Fun crowd arrived today, armed with a brand new battery-powered chainsaw, and some of the about half of the Norfolk pine went away. Uh, so we'll get more coming in. Um, okay, so uh, I'm happy with this, and uh, I don't think there's anything else. Nope, except Russ, get back to work. Yes, I do. Uh, thank you very much, Frank. Um, uh, I'm glad there is some interest in uh, pepper mills. That's good. And tonight's your opportunity to go back in the candy store back here and uh, pick up a couple of blanks, uh, and you'll be ready for the class um, because we won't be having that. Um, the the um, no well the, our pepper mill class will be before what would have been our November meeting anyway. So tonight's the night or come back anytime to Advantage Lumber, of course. So uh, I'm going to put on my, uh, my other microphone and uh, get started. All right, are we live? Yes, we are. All right, I don't want to blast you out here. How's that? Can you hear me all right? Turn it up a little. You have it up a little higher. A little higher? Go ahead. Okay. This is. How's that? How's that? Everybody hear him? What? Do you want to hear me? Maybe that's the question. <laughs> um, I did a demo for you uh, back in July 
making a wing bowl out of a cube. I had seen it uh, in a YouTube video. I always start off all my demos by kind of paraphrasing Will Rogers. He said, all I ever know is what I read in the newspaper. I feel as though I'm saying all the time, all I ever know is what I see on YouTube. It is so full of good information. It is also full of bad information. So be, so be selective and r watch more than one video because you will get conflicting opinions. But this one really did catch my eye. And um, so I'm not gonna do this tonight, but uh, this is to demonstrate one of the problems of doing one out of a block of wood. And you, you have to cut it a fairly uh, even cube as, as uh, accurately as you can. Uh, and when you turn it, you're gonna end up with a very nice uh, three wing bowl. Uh, the weakness, and I'm using that word intentionally, of doing it this way is that you have two things. You have grain going in every which direction on this. There's no, there's no real direction to rely on. On a regular bowl, uh, uh, a, um, a side grain bowl, we have end grain and we have side grain. And we know, we've learned over the years how to manage that. On this one, on every single facet of this bowl, you have a grain going in a different direction. So not only does that create a problem when you're turning, you've got to really ramp up your turning skills, and it's hard, very hard to scrape. You really have to turn this surface and then sand it. Uh, the other problem is that you've got one wing that's going to be quite weak, and uh, how do I know that? <laughs> I went back home to Vermont I took a beautiful piece of spalted maple. I have several maple trees that I cut down. I cut down one every year, and I, lie, I let them lie around, and so they're in varying degrees of spalt. And I took a piece. This, this tree only, was only cut last year. It's got some very delicate spalting in it. I had a piece almost identical to this. I went through the uh, same process. I made a cube. I, I, um, uh, and then when I was finishing it, I went and held this up on my disc sander just to clean up these edges a little bit. Snap. And the, the one wing, which would have corresponded to this one right here, just broke right off. So I ended up, I did make something out of it, but it was not the wing bowl I planned on. So I thought, well, how can I, how can I improve this technique um, and make all two good reasons for, for figuring this out. One is that they're all, they're all stronger. The grain in this one goes straight. Uh, so this was cut, uh, well, let me back up a little bit. I tried to cut a cube out of a big chunk of wood and get the grain oriented the way I wanted in the finished piece. And it turned into quite a problem of geometry. I tried several, just little ones, and I never got them exactly right. So the grain was perfectly oriented. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, why not just take a big block of wood, make a cylinder out of it, You'll, it'll be, uh, all the grain will be going um, uh, longitudinally, and then just turn the bowl out of that. Um, but that won't give me the wings, so how do I get the wings? Uh, I'll show you later in the demo, but anyway, it's a combination of turning and um, using the bandsaw. And so I ended up with this one, which um, the, uh, all the wings have the grain going this way. These are all good and rugged. Uh, this thing uh, is, unless I do something really careless and stupid, it's not gonna break. So that got me going on some others and I thought, well, I really wanna share this with the club because I sort of gave them a technique that works fine, but um, if you're not careful, uh, you'll, you can end up uh, with a broken piece. So I, when I got back down here last week, I dug into my pile. I got a couple pieces from Frank. And I thought, well, Norfolk pine, um, we almost always uh, have that just in round chunks. We don't have, we don't have turning squares. Um, so I got a couple pieces from him. This one was, in spite of the spalting, it was really quite green. It, it kind of smelled. Um, and I thought, well, wouldn't it be great if I could find a piece that would give me one nice knot on each wing. Uh, and it, there's no such thing as the perfect piece of Norfolk pine. Those, those knots are not symmetrical, even though some are pretty close. So this is what I ended up with, trying to get a knot into each wing. 
It just didn't work. <laughs> so, I mean, I can finish this, and it does have some nice spalting in it. it wasn't what I was looking for. Then uh, I remembered back to um, a, a demo that uh, Joe had done for us in the summer uh, where he uh, cored a piece of um, uh, Norfolk pine, and the coring came out, and um, uh, and he ended up, uh, I'm sure it was intentional, although we were sort of joking, it was an accidental uh, a design opportunity, as we call it. Um, uh, he ended up with the knots pretty symmetrically arranged in the bottom. So all I did was take another piece, and instead of trying to get my knots up here, uh, I've just got them all, and this turned out to be reasonably good. So it was just a case of instead of taking it out of the log here, I just moved down a little bit and uh, I'll end up with a fairly nice piece. As you all know, th uh, this is an end grain turning. Norfolk pine doesn't cut cleanly under the best circumstances, so <clears throat> it is a little tricky uh, when you get down in the bottom. Uh, normally, you have to, when you're doing end grain turning, you're, you have to turn uh, from the bottom up. You can't always do that, but there are some, some tricks. Uh, one of the things that I discovered was using a bottom feeding um, uh, gouge, and you can actually, you can run this gouge in both directions uh, and get a fairly clean cut. If you're very careful and you have a very sharp um, negative rake scraper, you can clean it up that way. Um, so it is a little trickier uh, with end grain turning, but um, you'll, you'll be uh, happier with the results. And you'll get more symmetry in the grain too. So. Uh, I will show you, uh, I won't take it all the way, but I've got a piece here uh, that I'll chuck up and I'll just kind of <clears throat> talk you through. Any questions so far? Always lock your, your, uh, chuck down to the spindle. Um, one thing that I like to do, and I mention it uh, when I teach classes, is uh, when I mount any piece of wood in a chuck, um, I always mark jaw number one. I don't know if these pencil lines are going to show up. I should have used a Sharpie. Anyway, there's a, a line there and a line there. So that way, certainly uh, while, you're, while you're doing your piece, you're going to take it out of the chuck a few times. And if you do that, your jaws are always going to be in exactly the same place as they were before. If they aren't, you'll find that your piece will have just a tiny bit of wobble in it. So, uh, and it still will, but it'll be less. So even though this demo is a lot of talk and not too many chips, we will make a few. Use the um, <clears throat> tailstock. Oops, that's not what I want. Use the tailstock as much as you can, um, but there'll be a point because this is a fairly small bowl. There'll, there'll be a point fairly early on uh, that I'll have to pull it away. Um, I think what I'm going to do with this one is I haven't decided. It's oak, and uh, it's not one of my favorites, but I'll see how it finishes up. Um, I think probably I'm going to make this a um, a uh, vessel with a small uh, a little finial. Um, backtracking, the whole reason I got interested in, uh, in doing more wing bowls, I had a show in Vermont this summer and I had 10 or 11 pieces in the show and they were mostly just to showcase the work. Um, and, uh, but they were, mo they were all for sale with, with one exception. The two that sold immediately the first day of the, of the show, and fortunately the buyers agreed to let them stay there until the end of the month, uh, were wing bowls. And I thought, well, there's something about a wing bowl that really catches people's eyes. So um, if you haven't tried them, um, 
um, think about it. And if you sell your work or just because you like to give nice things to people, uh, wing bowls are, are a little more showy than are just a regular bowl. They, they aren't always as functional. Sometimes they're really more for just sitting and looking. Oh, another, another advantage to doing them the way I'm going to demonstrate tonight is you're not restricted to that cube that is the same dimension on all sides. So that is a limiting factor in uh, what you can, uh, what you can uh, make out of a bowl. I'll show you one that really didn't make the cut. And I was just curious. I wanted a low squat bowl. Uh, and I thought, well, you're not restricted to uh, just three wings. So I tried five wings, knowing that if I'd made three, I would have, because the bowl is low, I curved the sidewalls in, which turned out to be kind of a mistake. Uh, but if you're doing a low squat bowl and you put, you've got more range for the shape of the bowl when, um, uh, when you use this technique. The reason this one didn't work was because when I made my cut on the bandsaw, even though the thickness of the wall here is the same as up here, it looks like it's much fatter because of the, uh, the way the wood was cut. So this is probably a reject, um, but if I'd made the bowl with a little bit more traditional flare shape, uh, that wouldn't have happened. But you can use this technique uh, for um, uh, any number of wings you want, and I'll, I'll show you how I do that. All right, any questions? Oh, I have to give my safety lecture. lecture. Always use a, a face shield. Uh, I mentioned these a couple times. Um, I don't like the big, heavy uh, um, face shields with the built-in um, uh, uh, respirator because they're heavy and they tend to fog up. So these are uh, 3M 9211, uh, and they're the best ones I've found. They seal really well, uh, and um, they don't cause your glasses to steam up. Another thing that I added to my inventory, I'll is that are prescription. Um, the, the thing that I don't like about, and I'll use these instead of the face shield because I'm not going to be making a lot of chips tonight, um, is that uh, they tend to restrict your vision. This is, this is my regular prescription, but the lenses are smaller, and I asked for the largest size they had, and this was it. So I really feel as though my range of vision is uh, more limited. Uh, but they do work, and of course they have the side protection. So I'll use them tonight. The reason I broke Frank's handle uh, last spring was because on my lathe at home, and he's gotten me a replacement, the shaft uh, inside um, uh, here is, uh, was bent, and in order to get it to tighten, I have to really bang down on it. And I used the same amount of force on his. It was not required, and the handle broke. So that's why we've got a little bit different handle here. I promise to make him a new one, and I will. Um, always. Do we have power? Always turn the lathe way down on low speed. Freehand turn it just to be sure. Um, particularly with, I gotta back up, talk about another kind of wing bowl. I forgot I brought these. I'm not gonna demonstrate. Um, if you've ever turned a big four wing bowl like this, it's just a board. Um, but these four wings, when they start spinning around, uh, they really sound like a helicopter hovering over your head. Uh, and, it, and if you happen to get a finger in the way, you know how much that can hurt. So this one I did um, freehand without any uh, aids. And I, I'm going to put a little lid on it like that. This was uh, like the one that sold immediately in my show. If you're, if you're nervous about the amount of air uh, wood that you're turning, call it, it's ghost wood, um, the time that your tool is in the air, um, then what you can do is just take some scraps of wood and laminate it on the edges, and that way you're just making a regular turning. 
and then your tool is uh, on solid wood the whole time. You've got that bevel control. So uh, I would recommend if you want to, to do a bowl like this, just put some scraps on it and cut these away, sand the edges. Uh, and it's a way to avoid that um, because it can be kind of scary when you're, when you're, uh, uh, when you've got that thing going around at 1,000 or 1,200 RPMs, which you really, you really need the speed to keep the tool uh, on the on the work surface. So uh, where was I? Always start your lathe slowly. Check. That's why I went back to those. Uh, it's very easy to set up, your, set your tool rest up, think that you're all good, and uh, turn it on. Come to find out, you're inside the. Uh, the, the circle made by those wings and then boom they hit on the tool rest so hand turn it once and turn it on slowly this is fairly small so we can get the speed up a little bit um, we really can't um, do any pull cut at this point so I'm just going to do a normal cut as if this were a side grain bowl just to get rid of a little bit of material You want to have your, your tip of your gouge pretty close to the center. That's why I had the tailstock. <laughs> what? <laughs> Good reactions in the front row. <laughs> Once again, go back to that starting point with your, with your uh, number one wing, uh, number one uh, jaw on the chuck. That was intentional, by the way, because you, you always learn so much more in a demo when something goes a little bit wrong. <laughs> So what I'm doing is I'm just very carefully nibbling that down. There are a couple of reasons for doing a, a pilot hole. Uh, the first one being um, it, it'll give you, I don't know if, if my uh, Forstner bit will go in all the way, but if, you're, if your bit goes in all the way, you can kind of establish the bottom of the bowl. The other reason is that you've got a hole there, um, so it's a place for chips to come out. And you're not, when I had that catch, it was because I was right in the middle, and that's really the, the most catchy point uh, of any piece, whether it's end grain or side grain. I have a set of um, a couple of long Forstner bits. I definitely like the ones with the uh, hex shank. I get these from uh, Grizzly and they're carbide. They're not really very expensive. Uh, and because of the hex, 
uh, they hold much better. I usually just put a little screwdriver or just something to get just a little bit more leverage. Um, for those of you who were uh, here last month, uh, I was demonstrating making a bowl from a board, and uh, I made quite a bit of smoke in the room. And um, my, uh, my, the technique was correct, but what I didn't do was check and see the speed that the lathe was on. It was set for high speed, not high torque. And when you're, when you're making a cut, um, Frank's tool that he made w was working perfectly. The lathe was not. And that's, I, in order to make the cut, I had to crank it up. And uh, when you're putting a straight tool in a curve, you're going to get a lot of friction. And that's the whole reason that it was smoking a little bit. So had I changed the belt and put it on a, a higher torque, um, it wouldn't have happened. And I did finish the bowl. Everything came out fine. When I make my travel mugs, they're almost all end grain. And your hand can get real tired. You're just turning in this fairly small uh, circumference. So this just makes it a little bit easier. It's not overworking the lathe. Almost the limit. It's not as deep as I want to go, but. <clears throat> Now, um, a good tool to use in this kind of a situation, if you, any of you have done hollowing, you know that uh, most hollowing tools now use carbide, little round carbide cutters. And uh, that's what I use in my, in my doing my mugs. And so that's the tool that I'm going to use uh, tonight. Uh, and I, I won't do a whole lot because I'm going to go to the next step uh, fairly soon. So. This is made by Harrison. Um, they're very good quality tools. I think they're made somewhere in the upper Midwest. Maybe somebody knows uh, something more about the company. You buy it, you can get, you get the handle and you get um, three or four different um, um, tips with it, depending on what you want. You can get a square one, a square one that has slightly radiused uh, edges. You can get a, a tip and they're all carbide. And I find in the hoe hollowing um, tool that I have, it's a little small um, bit like this, and it, and it really can be very aggressive. Uh, you, you can remove a surprising amount of material. Um, so what I'm going to do with this, I think I am going to have this be a vessel. So this, this hole that I've drilled is probably going to be the uh, dimension of 
I'm going to put an insert in it and then do a little finial. So the only part, because I don't have my hollowing equipment tonight, I'm just going to remove a little bit of material here. So what I'm shooting for, for a dimension out here on the rim, is pretty much the finished dimension of what I want those wings to be. Um, it's about 45 degrees to the point where I'm making contact. It was about 45 degrees all the way through. Yeah, if you, if you put it flat, I don't know if you can see that, it's going to get very grabby on you. So just like, like a scraper, just turn it up a little bit. Is that visible? Can you see that tool angle? Yeah, that's what you okay. see without the chips in the way. Yeah. So you, you were pretty much 45 degrees all the way. Yeah. Well, maybe as I'm bringing it around, I'm probably bringing it up a little straighter, but yeah, that's the safest way. You really, I mean, you can very carefully nibble away at it like this, but you do, it's a much higher risk of having a catch. And I've already demonstrated one catch tonight. I thought maybe that would be enough. <laughs> Uh, no, this one is dished, okay. um, which uh, I think you're asking that because can you sharpen it? Is that your, your question? Yeah. Um, some you can and some you can't. 
Um, uh, this one probably, you don't ever want to try to grind this because you'll never be able to do that accurately. But what you can do with some carbide cutters is take them off the tool, obviously, and just put them on a diamond stone and just very carefully rub them. And you can freshen up that edge a little bit. But uh, they're not that expensive. Um, when it really uh, gets dull, just throw it away and get another one. There is a little cup on this one. I'll hand it around. <clears throat> Um, okay, the next step. Um, we're going to make a three, three wing uh, piece out of this. So most lathes have indexing wheels on them. I don't know if this one does. Uh, yes, it does. And they're usually, uh, yep, this one is 48. Um, I don't know what you all have for lathes, and, but if it's a one-way, it's going to have 48. Frank, can they, do they uh, have them with, with a higher number, like a 96? No. Oh. Anyway, uh, it's helpful, but you certainly don't, you don't have to have that. So I will start at 48. You don't really need to use the pin, but I'll demonstrate it anyway. So that's what this pin here is for. You find 48, which is right here, and you lock it in. And you just put a tick mark here. It's more than a tick mark. That's a line. Then go up to 16. And 32. Now, obviously, if you don't have this, um, you can just use a plain compass. Um, the, um, the radius, you measure this, set your compass for the uh, radius of your piece, and then you make, you, you can get your three marks that way by just going around with your compass. You accomplish the same thing. So assuming this is all turned, hollowed out, and we've done whatever we want, um, we've had no, no wings exposed to your fingertips or anything. So the next step is to put the wings on the piece. And I'm going to go to another piece here. Now you have to use your imagination a little bit. Because we don't have a bandsaw. But this is a bandsaw table. I set it up for this one here. This is a bandsaw blade. That's showing up pretty well in the camera. So you've got your, your pencil marks here and here. And you line them up. Take a Sharpie and put a line across the uh, bandsaw table. It will not be in line with your normal kerf in the table because when you tip it up, that, that kerf is actually going to be up a half an inch or so. So just make a, make a line where you want to, where you're going to make the cut. Take your pencil marks and line them up on that line. And then just slide it across. And I know that most of you are thinking, oh, it's a round piece of wood and that's dangerous on a bandsaw. It is if you were trying to present it this way, because it can snag it out of your hands so quickly. But there are two reasons why it's not. First of all, it's, it's, it's sitting very firmly on the table. And you're also only making a, just a little bit of a cut, and then you're cutting a lot of air in here. So you're not working the machine hard. You don't have to push hard 
uh, and it's a very easy cut to make. And so you go across, make one cut, turn it, make the next one, like that, and then the third one, and you've turned a round bowl like that into a wing bowl. And then you just rechuck it on the lathe and um, do your finishing whatever way. Um, there's no set angle. The angle is determined. Um, back up a little bit. Um, let me move my pencil. Um, the angle will be determined, and I should have done this first. Um, just run your lathe very slowly. And um, decide where you want your wings uh, to come to uh, end, and then just put a pencil line on it. And then you'll take the, uh, the piece. And th that's what will determine um, what your angle is on the table. So here are my two uh, pencil lines. Uh, and I want to have the uh, table at the angle that will create a cut that will come right next to the pencil line here and intersect these two tick marks here. So it's going to be somewhere in here, a little bit like that, maybe a little bit more. It depends on the shape of the bowl here. Um, I showed you that on this bowl it didn't work out very well, but, that, but I still I got the angle for the table saw just the same way. And this is a system, I've only made a few uh, this way so far, uh, but it works very well. And the, the benefits are that it's a stronger bowl, you get the grain um, exposed in a very even way, all three wings are gonna be about the same, uh, and uh, you have much less of a chance of uh, having one of those wings uh, snap off on you. Uh, if you, a lot of people don't have a big um, uh, disc grinder. I've got a 20 inch at home in Vermont, uh, which I and a 16 inch here. The one here, uh, and it's direct drive, so I can't change the RPM on the disc. It goes way too fast. And um, when I was cleaning up, this piece of wood here came from uh, the factory or from the shipper with just, I think this was where a piece of strapping the, this board must have been on the outside of the, of the uh, lift of wood. So I was putting it on my disc sander here to just clean up that edge a little bit. And if you look closely, you'll see a, uh, I was cleaning, uh, working on this side, you'll see a glue line here. It grabbed it so fast, even though I was very, very careful. You want to put most of your pressure on the downside of the wheel, not the, not the upside. Uh, and it snapped it. It didn't pull it out of my hand, but it did crack it here. So unfortunately, that's a waste piece. So um, be very careful if you have, have a disc sander to, to touch it and just touch it, really have your contact be down through here. Um, if you need to touch up that side, don't let it be on your up side of the wheel because it's very easy to have it happen. Um, if you don't have one or you don't want to take a chance, I use this for all kinds of things. This is just a piece of uh, 80 grit sandpaper. You don't have to, it doesn't have to be round. You can just get sheets and I'll hold it up so you can see it. And then you can use this uh, like a, a stationary uh, grinder and you can clean it up very nicely. You'll find that when you use this technique, these points won't be all perfect. Uh, it, it won't be if you, if you use this technique either. So there's always a little bit of touch up just to bring all these into a nice point. So a, a, a device like this, can't do it that way. And it takes some patience. And you may, you may already have a, a, a sanding rig like this for uh, other applications. If you've got say, pieces that you just need to clean up the edge a little bit, it's very handy. Um, I think I've covered pretty much. Uh, I guess my summary is that um, I think it's going to prove to be a better way to uh, make a wing bowl. Um, 
uh, I like the idea of having the grain all oriented the same, and obviously, if you were making one out of Norfolk pine, you wouldn't want to do it any other way. Um, you could probably figure out a way to cut a cube out of a chunk of Norfolk pine, but it's surprisingly difficult when you don't have one face to orient against the, uh, the, uh, either the bandsaw or the table saw or whatever you're cutting it on. You're going to get it just a little bit off. This way it's always spot on. If you have a pith, like this one has a, a I don't know if I'm going to finish this, although it has nice spalting. If it's got a bad spot in the pith, you just put a little decorative plug in the bottom. You can figure out a way to hide that. Um, I don't have one here, but I frequently, for a vessel like this, I put little feet on it um, just to add a decorative touch. Um, but there are a lot of different ways you can finish it. Um, then sand it and finish it, not with this. <laughs> Although I, I want to repeat, there, there's nothing wrong with using that. You just do need to give it more time. Um, all right, take these off because I can only see the people right in front of me. <laughs> now I can see you all. Um, any questions on what I've covered? Yeah. Did you make a jig to put the fence on the bottom or were you able to move your uh, fence on the table? You mean like kind of turn it into a sliding table saw? No, I didn't. I just, uh, um, my bandsaw has a good clean surface on it. I have a nice fence. And so I was just, I was just running the piece right along the fence. So you, well, you have a fence on your, on your cycle? Oh. Um, this is not a jig, this is a bandsaw. <laughs> and this is my fence. Yeah, your fence can slide anywhere across the entire surface. Oh, yes, yeah, okay, I, I, now I understand your question. Um, some fences uh, grab in a way that you can't just lift them off. With mine, I, I can lift it off, take it and put it around on the other side of the saw. And that distance from the very edge of the table was sufficient. Right, if you're doing a larger bowl, and there, I don't think there's any reason why you couldn't, you would have to d make a dedicated table to go on your bandsaw to enlarge it. And if you're gonna do a lot of them, um, come, do a, um, like you've all made, made um, uh, cutting sleds for your table saw, you could make one just as easily for your bandsaw and it would work a lot better. Um, but if you're only doing a couple, there's no need. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's just friction. And you take two points, and, and this will go right into your um, headstock, and this will go right into the tailstock. And you start, and you, the first thing you do is make a tenon, and then you've got something to grab. And then you can, uh, but yeah, you, all you're doing when you're holding it this way, uh, it's just a little bit of friction here. If you do have a catch, it's just going to spin. Right. Um, and um, create your tenon, and then put your chuck on. So put it in the tenon. Well, the first step is that yeah, there is there is an excellent um, YouTube video video on uh, doing a wing bowl out of a cube. And um, uh, if you want to try it that way, I urge you to to uh, watch it. it. It's it's a very interesting video, and it, it really caught my attention. So, anyway, um, if you want to make wing bowls. Um, you can use their method or you can use my method. I'm claiming this is my own. I'm sure somewhere out there there's a video of a guy that did it uh, the, uh, the same way. But I do feel it's a little better way to do it. Um, any other questions? Tom, do we have a uh, raffle tonight? <laughs>